You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, presented by The Nation Network. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Oilers Nation Radio, episode 126. It is a frosty Friday afternoon at Edmonton, but that's okay, because our takes are hot, just like our Oilers are hot, and that's ready to lead you into the weekend. Massive series coming up against the Leafs. We're going to look at that in a second, but first, I want to intro... I am Bag Milk, your host for the next hour of your life. I am here with Nation Dan. He is in bed, but you can't see that. And I'm with Tyler Yaremchuk. He is in his office looking sharp as always. We are a trio today. And as we do every week, we start off by thanking our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant and Sherwood Park, Alberta. Still time to winterize that vehicle. I thought it was getting warm and it's chilly today. My dog Frank wouldn't even go outside. I get it. I get it. That's why you need to head down to Sherwood Ford. Get yourself prepped. Maybe you just need an oil change. Maybe you need some new tires. Maybe you want a fresh whip entirely. They've got whatever you need. They've got what you want. I promise you. Follow them on Twitter, at Sherwood Ford, and on Instagram, at Sherwood Ford underscore the giant. Mr. Uramchuk. Yeah. What is our giant question of the week? Our Sherwood Ford giant question of the week. What a month it was for our Edmonton Oilers. So the question is, who's the Oilers MVP for the month of February? That's a simple mm. question. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to add a caveat to this though, because yep. the easy answers, let's I'll take the David easy guys, and let's, let's take the easy guys off the board. Yep. Connor, Leon, you are not allowed to choose either of them because they are both MVPs in your program and in your heart. Now, Mr. Nation, Dan with Connor and Leon off the board, who would you say, my friend is your Oilers MVP for the month of February? Well, Rick is going to be devastated because he's not here to say it. Yeah. But for me, it's yes, a pool mm-hmm. He's been, he's been a light in, at the end of a tunnel uh, on the right-hand side for Connor McDavid that we've been looking for, for a long time. Uh, he came in, I think sooner than any of us had hoped, planned, whatever, however you want to put it. Uh, and, and has absolutely been a star up there. Um, you know, he's, He's shooting the puck when he needs to. He's in front of the net, grinding it out when he needs to be. He's getting punched in the face and just taking it like a champ and allowing us to get a power play because of it. Uh, he's just, he's been, he's been exactly what this team has needed for a long time. He looks comfortable out there. He looks like he's just a perfect fit. He's working well with all the boys. He's, he's it, everything about him. It's just trending up and it, the arrows are up. And that's exactly what you ask for from him. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's been amazing to watch even off the ice. He's taken interviews like a champ. He's, he's our MVP for sure for me for the month of February. Mr. Uremchuk, who is your mm-hmm. non Connor or Leon MVP for February? I'm going to the blue line. And this guy has been putting together an unbelievable season. My MVP is Darnell nurse. In the month of February, he did not play less than 23 and a half minutes in any game. He was over 23 and a half minutes every single night facing the other team's best players, being used in all situations, putting up points as well. He had four goals and four assists in the month as well. There is a conversation, I think, if he keeps playing this well, about Darnell Nurse being a Norris candidate. And it's because of his play in the month of February, the Oilers have been cutting down on their goals against the goaltending is a big part of that. But I think Darnell nurse being a number one defenseman on this blue line is a huge part of it as well. Darnell nurse is my MVP for the month. Hard to argue. In fact, you stole my answer. So while you're talking about Darnell nurse, I've been looking through who I'm going to pick as my third option. Since you guys both picked some wonderful choices. Hmm. Should I pick Nuge because it would be very on brand and people would expect me to do it? Should I pick Tyson <laughs> Berry because he started to turn things around, put up points as we all hoped he would? Hmm. There's some sneaky picks too in the third and fourth lines. You know that, what? Yeah. That have been stirring the pot. I agree with you, Dan. And that's why I'm going to give some love. I, I don't know if I would call him an MVP, but he deserves some love in this conversation that we're having right now. Juju Arcara. 
I'm giving Jujar some love. I'm a big Kara guy, have been since he was drafted. I've been bummed out to see that he was kind of, he kind of fell off a cliff for a lot of us for, you know, a couple of seasons after a really good one, a really good campaign a couple of years ago. But since he's come back from the taxi squad, he has looked really, really good. He now has two goals, five assists for seven points in 13 games with the Oilers so far this season. He's got two points in his last five. He has really established himself on the line with Archibald and Ennis right now. And those guys are really looking really, really good. So I don't know if I would necessarily call him an MVP, but I would say he deserves some love for the way he's come back into the lineup. You dark care. I'm, I'm picking the hammer. And hopefully That's he can keep this role in here too. Cause I mean, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago and now it seems like this isn't just a heater. This has been a pretty sustained chunk of good play from Kara. But if he keeps this rolling, man, like it was looking like his NHL career was over there for, for yeah. a couple of weeks. And I don't think that was much of a stretch. He's found a way to turn it around. Like I think he cleared waivers once this year. I don't think Jujar Kara clears waivers again. If you throw him on there, I think he's no. playing that well. No. Yeah. I, I just agree. think that he's, he's doing everything you want. And honestly, Boys, how about last night? He almost scored a fucking shorty for the ages last night. He was inches away. If he had been able to tuck that past Demko, that would have been a highlight reel goal that we would have watched for the rest of time. So it's just, it's encouraging because it's not just Connor and Leon. You've got other teams that are able to contribute. And I think for me, in this conversation, at least, Jujar Kara is a big part of that. Dan, were you going to say something before? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think giving him the nod is also giving a nod to his line mates and the fact that, that our special teams... Um, have really been shored up by his play. The, the penalty kill, the last few games especially, has been exactly what we had last year. We talked about it on previous Huge pods. Huge last night too, Dan. Yeah, we, we, we talked about it on previous pods. They, they, they've started to establish that pressure at the blue line, and it is throwing teams off. And Vancouver has a really lethal power play. They have some pretty good offensive players, and they weren't able to get anything established against us except for maybe one one of those power plays last night. So, yeah, he, I I agree with you, Bag Milk. He's not maybe not the the MVP, but you can't you'd be remiss to not talk about his his month and that fourth Lions month in February. I just think he needs some love. Like I said, I don't know if that's an MVP. Probably not. Nobody would say he's the MVP, but definitely worth some love as well. Another guy who deserves some love is Jesse Pugliar. He scored a big goal last night on the power play. The thing I want to talk about is not just that he's playing well, but how much fun does this guy look like he's having right now? When he scores, there is just a a beaming sense of joy that comes out of him, and I am here for it. Even Dave Tippett last night in his postgame commentary talked about how much fun Jesse looks like he's having, and I am loving it. Tyler? Yeah, I mean, Tippett was talking about how it just he's got the biggest grin, and hearing Tippett talk about Pugliarvi like that, when everything was so sour with the previous regimes and the previous coaches on JP, it's just, you know, I think there's so many people that deserve credit for him turning this around. I think JP deserves a lot of credit. I think, yep. you know, the, not JP's agent, but I heard that, you know, McDavid's agency kind of had some say in how this whole thing went down. I think they deserve a lot of credit in this. Holland deserves credit. Tippett deserves credit. McDavid and Nugent Hopkins are good line mates there. They deserve credit as well. I, I honestly didn't see this coming. I thought he'd have a little bit of success, but at the beginning of this season, I was still sitting there going, this guy's probably cracking bait, right? They're probably going to dangle him in the expansion draft. That's why he signed on for the second year. I even thought maybe there might've been like a wink behind the scenes. Like, Hey, you sign this second year and don't worry. We'll let you go to Seattle. There's no chance. Now he's a permanent fixture in this top six. He's a permanent fixture in this core. In my opinion, I know it's only been a month of good games here, but he's here to stay man. And it is a great sign when a fourth overall pick starts playing like a fourth overall pick. Well, and tell us about Jesse. For me, it's just been, it's been communication. Communication for Jesse has been, you know, like you watch it and, you know, you're talking about the the relationship he had with the previous regime, him and Tippett spend time talking all the time. Uh, You see it on the bench. He didn't used to interact with his teammates as much as he does now. You saw it last night a couple of times where Leon's telling him, you know, little things to, to do going, going into the zone. And and it's just, I think it, it, it really just speaks to the fact that Jesse put in the effort to, to work on his English. It's not an easy language by any means, let alone coming from finished English. It's uh, it's just, yeah, it's full marks all around, but Jesse's is the, to me is, is the, uh, is the, the guy that has guided his, his return to the NHL and his excellence now that we're seeing uh, going forward. 
I agree with both of you that Jesse deserves a lot of credit for obviously putting the work in to get where he's at right now. Um, I also think some of the core players that were around in round in round one also deserve a little bit of love for just welcoming him back with open arms, despite the weirdness of the last two years. You know, um, I think it could have been easy for for the Nuges and Dry Sidles and McDavid to just be like, ah, oh, whatever. Who knows mm-hmm. what's going to happen with this guy, but that by all accounts does not seem to be the case. And everybody is talking very glowingly about, about Jesse. And maybe he's just channeling a little something from wearing DeHarnay's number, you know, mm-hmm. just a little bit of that postseason magic. <laughs> Jesse Pugliarvi, Tyler, you'll like this one though. I put in a bet that he would clear eight and a half goals by the end of the year. So did buddy, I. He's at six right now. I'm looking real good on that one. I'm looking forward to getting that early payout by like the halfway point of the season here. Like knock on wood, he needs to stay healthy now, but that's a bet. I put a decent little amount of coin on and I'm excited to get my payout. Not me not too, this buddy. week, not this week, but I think some point in the near future, we should do a revisit of our, uh, of our early predictions and our, all of our kind of like our goal bets and that kind of thing. It'd be fun. Remember when I said Tyler Ennis would come top five on the team in scoring. They're still <laughs> not looking great. Hey, he's still t- he's turning it around playing, though. He's playing the right way now. Yeah, it's uh, he he earned that spot to to replace Cahoon for a couple of days. And man, how good has Cahoon looked again since since coming back up into that second line? So yeah, it's everything <laughs> with this team outside of maybe Kyle Turris has been clicking on all cylinders. It's what funny did, because uh, I was actually a little bit surprised when uh, Cahoon got put back up with Dry and Yano. Yeah the other day and then what does he do he just goes and pumps home too and i'm like all right I'll, this is another instance of me needing to shut the fuck up Tyler. dave Tippett's just seeming to push all the right buttons right now i know there was a little bit of talk last year like oh should he be in the jack adams conversation he should be again this year as well there's been twice this month where i've gone ah oh, why is he starting smith tonight he should go back to koskinen yeah. in this spot and then bang mike smith plays unbelievable and you're like oh, okay never mind he pulls ennis off that line puts Cahoon back on and i'm kind of like what are you doing, man? Like, quit messing with this. Ennis looked fine there. Bang, Cahoon scores twice. He's pushing all these right little buttons right now, even moving JP up when he did. Perfect timing on that. Putting Kara with Ennis and Archibald then bringing Kara back in the lineup for a battle of Alberta when you knew he'd be fired up. Bang, right button pushed there. Everywhere Tippett turns, he's making right choices. And I, and, and I think he probably is going to deserve some Jack Adams love. Like, when you look at this Oilers team at the end of the year, when it's award season, McDavid's going to be in the conversation for the heart. I win. honestly think there's a chance Darnell Nurse is in the conversation to be a Norris candidate. I'm not going to say he's going to win the Norris, but he should be in that three, four, five range if he keeps yep. up this level of play. Dave Tippett could be in the Jack Adams conversation too. Like there's there could be a lot of hardware coming to Edmonton this year. Hopefully, you know, a little bit more on top of that. But in terms of individual awards, there's a lot of guys deserving of some love. You want a bold prediction here, Tyler? I think Connor McDavid, not just he's not going to just be in the running for the 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 Art Ross, the Hart, all the MVP type trophies mm-hmm. that he's always in the mix for he's also going to be in the mix for the rocket richard this year i thought you were about I'm to gonna... say con Smythe. well yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely should be in the running for the con Smythe because when the oilers win the cup connor will be the first to get the trophy obviously and he would have earned it so yes i agree but i do think that he will be in the running legitimately for the rocket richard he is just it's funny when games when he's not getting goals necessarily maybe He's doing so many other great things. And then all of a sudden he'll just rip a hat trick. Like it's nothing. Yeah. We don't even really react to McDavid hat tricks anymore. It's just kind of like a cool thing that happens. Like they've become so normal almost when he rips off those games. Like, Oh, McDavid's doing McDavid things again. If you had told me, you know, six years ago that just four point nights, five point nights would just become common. And it's just another day at the office of what we get to watch. Uh, Tyler said it a bunch of times and I'm going to say it again. Now we are so lucky to be able to watch this dude on a nightly basis that we become almost jaded and just, Oh, another three point period for McDavid. Weird. It's just, it's pretty incredible. One of the things that uh, I think it was Elliot Friedman touched on was the awards uh, voting as well. Like the process goes through writers that cover their local teams and those writers aren't seeing any of the other, of the other uh, divisions players. So there's an element of there's going to be more Canadian voters 
this year than there is, I think American voters, they do have more, but of course they're split amongst three div- yeah. different divisions. So I don't know. It's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a toss up to see whether, whether Canadian players do get a little bit more of a, you know, a little bit more love because they are seeing Darnell nurse light up teams um, at a pretty consistent basis. And, you know, it, not even just the offensive numbers with Darnell. He is, he is playing really good hockey. You know, he's, he's, he's cut out a lot of the stuff. I think even early on in the season, they had like little giveaways and little, little pinches that weren't great, but now it doesn't seem to be an issue. My Siri well, agrees with me as you can hear in the background. I'm sure with Darnell nurse too. Like he's also, I know Tyler said he's averaged over 23 minutes, but there are nights when he just plays a fucking ton. Last weekend against Calgary, he played over 30 minutes in a back-to-back set. That's nuts. That's crazy. I don't think that should happen all the time, but pretty great. Uh, before we get to the season preview or the series preview against the Leafs, which is coming up starting tomorrow, which is Saturday, I want to thank our friends at skipthedishes.ca for helping make this possible. I am going to get something to eat tonight because it is Friday and I feel like celebrating and I have no food in my house because I've been avoiding going to the grocery store because I would rather order food and make up excuses for why I don't go to the grocery store. Tyler, you ever do that? You ever order something because you're like, ah, I don't have any food. You could go to the grocery store, but you just don't want it. You ever have that? That's me tonight, man. Like usually like the rotation in, in my residence with my girlfriend is we usually pick up groceries Saturday morning is when we go to our groceries. So Friday night, it's perfect. There's never any food in the house. Just worked a week, put your feet up, order some, skip the dishes. It's a great combo. Dan, you ever do that where you're just like, I'm feeling lazy today. It's a skip day. So while I learned uh, in in the household here, uh, we've learned of PC Express. And so we order all of our groceries, but you you do it tonight. That way you have a couple days of ordering stuff on Skip the Dishes. And then uh, then you got the groceries to fill in the the back order there. It's a little bit chilly. I'm feeling like a soup kind of day for me, boys. Skipthedishes.ca, thousands of restaurants, thousands of options. Go get yourself something to eat. And as Tyler always says, tip your drivers. Tip your drivers. Get a big Uh, bowl of chili. Hmm? That'd be nice. It feels like a chilly kind of Friday. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, we're talking about the Leaf series coming up here. Obviously, the Oilers are pushing for first in the division. But before we get to that, I asked a question today on Twitter, and I'd love your opinion. I've got a bunch of, uh, of listener feedback as well. Oilers rolling right now. We all know it. Zach Cassian is going to be coming. Cl- He's got to be getting close to coming back into the lineup at some point here. The question I posed on Twitter and now I pose to you two gentlemen, where does he go? There's no room. There's no room in the top nine. Uh. Oh, excuse that voice crack. Um, I am the producer, so I could edit it out, but I won't. Uh, there's no room <laughs> in the top nine. So really the only wiggle room right now in this lineup, barring injuries on the fourth line, Haas is a centerman, which Cassian isn't. So Haas is locked in. So you're probably what flipping Cassian to his left side to play with Haas and chase on. That's really the only spot you have for him. And then when or Neil comes back, it's an even bigger Chason, shit show. You know, it's like a coin flip he and chase on, but chase on's also scoring right now. He's chase on scoring. scoring and with, and if Neil's not in the lineup, they're probably going to want to keep chase on there for the power play. Right. So they can keep splitting time between him and pull Yarvey. So I think you have to flip chase on to the left side, play Cassian on the right or do vice versa. But that fourth line's the only spot for Zach Cassian to play right now. This is an interesting time for him to try and come back from injury when the Oilers in the middle of a fucking heater too. That is not an easy spot to be in, especially with the contract numbers, the style he plays. You got like, we all said it already. His spot next to Connor is gone. That one is now Jesse's Dan. Where's he fit? Yeah. For me, I I believe that you don't lose your spot in the lineup uh, because of injury, but, but yeah, he's definitely lost his, he's lost his spot in the, in the top, the top six for me, I think, I think he probably comes in and he, him and chase on and Neil are just kind of the, you know, who, who Tippett thinks is going to go tonight and have a, have a game kind of the grandpa Simpson, GIF type in and out kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, and they, and that's you know it is what it is because because for me you can't take Jujar Kara out of that lineup right now. No, he's killing penalties for the team. It's just yep. you know and 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 Ennis again. I like I said on the left side on that third line, he's he's doing all the right things. He's he's in the mix. He's not necessarily scoring, but he's but he's in the right spot on the ice every time. You're not you're not you're not frustrated with him, and he can't play center, so he's not he's not solving anything in the middle there. So yeah, for me, it's, he's, he's just rotating in and out right now. And, and that's fine. You know, it sucks money wise to have what we've, what we're rotating in and out between chase on Neil and Cassian, but 
it is what it is. And, and, you know, injuries are going to continue to happen and people are going to get run down as the season rolls on. Now we are going to have a few more, uh, a few more off days, which is nice, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just see them rotating in and out. Well, to Dan's point here uh, about injuries likely coming, the Oilers get into a 18 games in the next 31 days. So it is a very heavy schedule. Very, very heavy schedule. So, you know, Tip's going to be rotating people in and out. Uh, just to wrap this up, I did ask the question on Twitter. Here's some feedback, boys. Let's give it a uh, – Just, I'm just curious what you think. So, Pooley RV the God just says he doesn't fit. Uh, Surveyor Brett says he fits on Cameo? Question mark? Oh, no. See, <laughs> and this is kind of one of those things. I brought it up last week. Like, I could see why the Cameo thing is kind of like poking the bear a little bit. That's all I'm saying. Do what you want to do. I'm just saying. Uh, next up, archaeologi. Archaeologi. Matt Henderson says press box. Gravy D says on the Kraken's roster. So there is not a lot of love for Cassian coming in right now from Oilers fans. I rise says in the Oilers lineup, I think he might be a better fit on another team's line. EB Heater says as a trade piece to the pens to firm up Brian Burke's grit boner. <laughs> Kate Talk Mule says. Haas, Chieson, Cassian wouldn't be the worst fourth line in the world. So now we're actually getting some realistic things. That's kind of going what the boys are saying. Uh, Ozzy says, again, 44 uh, with Haas and Chieson or Neil. Again, that's what Tyler says. Ron says, taxi squad. Kabir says, fourth line, taxi squad, and that's about it. Scott says, the spot where Patrick Russell was supposed to play yesterday, which was in the press box. So, Are you surprised a little bit how, I don't want to say turned on, but how quickly Oilers fans have just been like, eh, if he doesn't play, I don't well, care. Well, when he's not playing with McDavid, he's a bottom six winger. And that was the problem with paying him three point some million dollars. Now, granted, it's great that he's not a winger with McDavid because it just means someone, yes, a Pugliarvi, has jumped up and taken that spot. But that's the issue with paying these support players term and money is when they lose their role in the top six, what's the difference between Cassian and you know, one of those other guys, he's just a bottom six winger. So you'll play him in the bottom six. And I think we just kind of have to accept that's his role going forward. Well, and for me, it's, you know, sorry, Eric Francis, but it's depth. It's, it's one of those things we have it, we have it now and, and we're going to continue to have it. And he's a guy that you, you, you're excited to have in the chamber for a playoff run. He's, he's going to come in and he's going to energize the team. If we're getting pushed around by another team, you know, I don't, I don't think we do get pushed around by most of the teams in the North division, but that Western, uh, that Western semifinal or the Western final, I guess, uh, against a Vegas, maybe we are having some problems with uh, being pushed around and, and he comes in and, and he fires up the boys with that. So yeah, it's just, you know, it, it, at the time he signed that contract, he was, he, he, he was trending in every right direction. And then as soon as he signed on the dotted line, it was just, you know, he, he lost the confidence of Tippett. He got into it with Kachuk and was just, you know, was a kicking guys, like just, just everything about it was a mess. And so, yeah, Oiler fans we're we're, I don't say, I don't say we're fair weather, but we're fickle. And when you're not performing at the, at the level that you signed a contract to agree to, that's uh that's bad news for you in, in Oilers opinion, Oilers fans opinion, which, which you understand. But uh, for Cassian, he's just gotta, you know, he's just gotta come in and play his role. Even if that's five minutes a night, play his role, do exactly what he needs to do and work his way up the lineup again. It's, you know, it's not unheard of to have him, have him come in and, and play well and maybe find a spot on that third line going forward. But uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a road uphill right now for Cassian. Going to be interesting to see where he fits. Dave Tippett is going to have some big choices to make with his line combos in the coming weeks. Uh, you too, my friends, the listener, could have some interesting choices to make, particularly if you decide to go to Jasper for a weekend in the mountains. Why do I say that, Dan? Well, because they have all kinds of options and activities for you to do that are outside and socially distanced to make sure you and your family are safe during these strange, strange days. However... Regardless of what's going on with the old pandemic, Jasper is just as beautiful as, as it ever was, and there's plenty to do. Seeing as spring is just around the corner, probably not the worst time to start booking your travel to Jasper as well. You will enjoy your stay, I promise you. If you want some more details on what is available to do, what kind of deals are out there to be had, visit jasper.travel. Again, that is jasper.travel. Go spend a weekend in the mountains. It'll look good on you. Take a break. You've earned it. 
Gentlemen, I can't think of a bigger series coming up than this three-game set the Oilers have against the Toronto Maple Leafs that kicks off tomorrow. That is Saturday at 5 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Real quick here, as we've got a special guest coming up, we've got Shane Corson coming in a few minutes. What are you guys expecting from this three-game set against the Leafs? Dan, I want to start with you. There's some interesting notes I saw today on Twitter. Austin Matthews listed day-to-day with a hand injury. Uh, Freddie Anderson is out uh, for a little bit. So the Leafs are banged up right now, and the Oilers are coming into town when they, you know, they're not looking like the team that they were before. Uh, Yeah, I mean – couldn't have picked a better time to have the schedule makers set us up for the, for a three game set hosting the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, you know, for, for Leaf fans, they're upset because they've lost their number one defenseman. What does that, where does that sound like similar to us with, with our issues? Uh, they've lost their starting goaltender. Again, we had, you know, we've had one goalie for, for half the season and we've been able to overcome it. It's uh, it's the right time for us to be matched up against the Toronto Maple Leafs. As Frank Saravelli said, we're going to sweep them. And I agree with him. He didn't say that exactly, but, uh, you know, you, I think you get it. You get, <laughs> you, get that, <laughs> you get that first win and, uh, and they, they're going to start, they're going to start panicking there. This, this team, this Oilers team has played the Leafs well in every game. They've, they've lost two out of the, out of the four, but, but every game has not felt like we were, we were outclassed or outplayed by any means. Uh, our wins haven't been pretty either, but I, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be an exciting matchup. And again, you know, you've got the Leafs primed and ready to, to lose two out of three at worst, I think. And, uh, and then you're, then you're looking at winning that division already and we're, we're in a position to, to keep it rolling. So yeah, I'm excited. Tyler, what are you expecting from this three game set? I'm expecting him to be three really good games and I'm expecting the Oilers to get anywhere between three and four points, I think is kind of the expectation here. A record of one, one and one or a record of two and one should be the expectation right now with this hockey club. And I I think that's doable with the way they're playing and how the Leafs are kind of banged up right now. So that's what I'm looking at. Hopefully they're entertaining games as well. It's been a little hit and miss with the Leafs. We've had some real thrillers and kind of that one snooze fest uh, mixed in there, but Hey, as long as the Oilers are on top, I mean, you won't get a lot of complaining from anyone here. And I think too, like I've said this a couple of times now, I said it against the flames. I said it against the Canucks. This is an opportunity for the Oilers to kind of flex a little bit and kick a team while they're down. While the Leafs are still winning, they're seven, two and one in their last 10. They are a little bit banged up right now. So I think that is an opportunity to kick them. That's an opportunity to steal some points and it's going to be a fun series to me right now, as we record this on February 26, Edmonton and Toronto look to be um, two big players in the North division with Winnipeg coming up a little bit behind them as well. So I'm excited about it. This is going to be a big measuring, a uh, big measuring stick for the Oilers to see where they're truly at, even with the Leafs having some, uh, some injury troubles. So before we move on to our special guest, Shane Corson, I'm just going to go around the horn real quick. Mr. Nation, Dan, your score prediction, game one against the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'm going to say five. You were four. correct last week, sir. Yeah, you were. Right. Shut it down. I nailed it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to say 5-4 win for the Oilers on Saturday night. That is a bet for the over. Mr. Tyler Uremchuk, game I'm one. I'm going over as well. 5-3 Edmonton Oilers. I'm going to go 4-2 with an empty netter for the good guys. Josh Archibald, Sultan of Sink, he gets that empty netter every day of the week. We're all calling for a game one win. Overall, series, it. overall, because we won't talk again until the series is over. What's everybody thinking? I'm going to say if, if they go two and one, two. I'm happy. Yep, two and one. I'm saying sweep. I'm doing it. Dan's got the I, I just think this team, is, this team is spicy right now. They are hot and... <laughs> I don't see them losing. I just, I don't know. They're clicking right now. They keep playing the game that they've been playing. Tighten up a little bit more, you know, stop, stop making Smith have to make his double stack pad saves. Uh, well, he didn't have to make that one, but you know, stop having to make the heroics there. And this team is pretty unbeatable right now. And I love to see it. Oilers have one now six straight on the road, looking to make it seven against Toronto tomorrow. Again, leave us a review. Let us know. I want to know your score predictions. Maybe put that in the review. You know, we'll read those out. We've got a very special guest coming up right now. Former Edmonton Oiler, former Toronto Maple Leaf too, actually. Shane Corson coming up on Oilers Nation Radio.
You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Welcome back to Oilers Nation Radio. Special guest this week on the pod, former Oilers, Shane Corson. Shane, how's it going, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. Perfect. We're excited to have you on. And before we kind of get into your career and stuff, let's just start with talking about this season because, I mean, this all-Canadian division, it's been fantastic. It's given us some great games and really great stories in every single market. Uh, How much of the hockey have you been finding yourself catching? I've actually been watching quite a bit this year. I'm trying to keep up with the, the Habs and the Leafs and the Oilers. Uh, play for all three, so it's yeah. exciting exciting hockey. I mean, the young talent now, they got a lot of skill and a lot of ability in all three teams, so it's been fun to watch. Could you imagine back in your career having to go through a season where as an Oiler you have to play the Flames ten times and then the Leafs nine times and all these rivalries building up? Like That would have just been insane, especially back in the era you played in. Yeah, it would have been very interesting. Let me tell you, they're already interesting enough. When I played in Edmonton, uh, us and Calgary had some pretty good wars. So, and then when I was in Montreal, it was Montreal, Quebec, or Montreal, Boston. And then when I played in Toronto, it was more Ottawa. So it was pretty, pretty fun. But to play them 10 times or three games in a row, I think there'd be a lot of uh, crazy, crazy nights if that was to happen. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it, it's going to get crazy like that, Shane? Or do you think it's going to be more these teams are just kind of approach it tactically, kind of like, okay, we know what this team is now. Let's approach this differently and try to get a win, almost like football, I guess. Yeah, and even baseball. You know, you watch the, I've watched, watched a lot of the Blue Jays, so they, they play them three or four games in a row, so it's a lot different now with the hockey. But, I mean, I think you've seen already this year, there's been a few, uh, few games where it's got a little nastier than it has in the last five years. But, for sure, teams take the advantage to watch the watch the uh, video and the tapes and and uh, know what to know what to expect uh, more in the second, third games to get to know each other a lot more and what their 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 abilities are and what their weaknesses are. So it definitely helps uh, in that area. But uh, I think you've already seen a little bit more of the aggressiveness and the fighting. I know the fighting has been taken out of the game a lot. And I I understand uh, it to a, a point why it has been, but. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's ever going to be as nasty as it was in the 70s or the 80s. And I'm um, giving my age away now. <laughs> the game's uh, changed. This is, of course, Oilers Nation Radio. And the Oilers fans, they're feeling good right now, Shane. This team is on quite a heater. What are some things that you've picked up on from watching this team lately that they're doing really well? Like, what's sort of allowing them to, to win as many games as they are in this stretch? Well, obviously, McDavid and Dreisaitl are incredible hockey players. And they're just, they're two of the best, uh, if not the two best, I think in the league, um, they're right up there anyways. Obviously, McDavid, I think, is probably the best player right now in the league, and he's playing on incredible. They're getting some secondary scoring too, though. I think that's helped a lot. I mean, Smith's played pretty well the last few games, so I think that's helped too. Goaltending's a big part of it. Uh, I've known that. I've played with some great goaltenders, uh, Patrick Waugh and, and Grant Fuhr and Billy Ramford, uh, another great goalie. So uh, goaltending plays a big part of it. And I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Darnell Nurse has improved and, and matured a lot and is, is playing really well for them. And uh, I think it's the, the secondary score. Nugent Hopkins is just a great all-around player. So I think they're they're buying into Tippett. I think I love – I played for Tippett in Dallas for 15 games and loved him as a coach and as a person. And uh, I think they're starting to buy into his uh, coaching style. And uh, it's just exciting. they got a great team and – uh, I mean, they're a little bit, they're a little bit deeper. Uh, the, the kid came back from Finland is playing pretty good and putting some goals in the, in, in the net. So it's helping out. You can't just depend on dry side and McDavid, which they have in the past. And I think the, the secondary scoring has really helped a lot. When you're working through a heater like this, Shane, I, I'm curious from your perspective, if you're on a team that's playing this well right now, Oilers are winning yeah. lots of different ways. What do you think's going on in the dressing room right now to try and keep this going? Or do you, t- is that something you talk about as players or do you just kind of look at the next game as the next task to handle? Well, I hate to be that guy, but that's what you do. You got to take it game by game. Things can turn pretty quickly, but I'm telling you, you get on a roll and you get confidence. You start believing in your room and yourselves and your teammates and and everything. It's just the game seems so much easier and it seems to slow down the game. It seems a lot slower than it was when you're struggling. So, and and all players and all teams go through it. You go through tough times. You go through times like this. And I mean, it's a lot more fun going through times like this. But uh, Mm -hmm. when you get into a a role like this and you have the confidence, the game just, like I said, slows down. It seems a lot easier. And you just got to enjoy the ride and keep doing what you're doing. And, work hard and you know that at some point you can't get too high or get too low. And that's something Bob Ganey taught me and Wayne Gretzky taught me. You can't get too high or too low. Um, you got to just keep even keel because there's ups and downs throughout a season, throughout a game. You know, you can have a great period and then have a bad, a bad period or a great shift and a bad shift. And you just got to try to keep your emotions intact and just keep doing what was, what you're doing to keep things positive. 
the Oilers are kind of at one end of the spectrum. Then over on the other side is another one of your former teams, the Montreal Canadiens <laughs> and the news that they fired Claude Julien. And we had this debate on one of our other podcasts, you know, does firing a coach give a team a boost? And for you and your experience, what's kind of, does the mood in the room like really change when there's a coaching decision like that? And a coach is like, go like what kind of happens behind the scenes there? I mean, it's tough. I mean, uh, I'm a good friend of Mark Bergevin. I played with him in St. Louis. We were roommates in the World Championship. We roomed together on the road. So I know he's just trying to give his team a, a kick in the butt and, and get them going. I mean, it's unfortunately now the players are paid so much money. It's sometimes easier to get rid of the coach than his players, right? But it's the players in the end that go out in the ice. Uh, the coaches can do their job and try to prepare you for the game. But the players are the ones that go out in the ice and win or lose the game, in my belief. So, um, and for being in the dressing room, I, only really experienced a coach being fired uh, at the beginning of the season or near the middle of the season was uh, George Burnett in Edmonton. Um, other than that, uh, Pat Burns was there until the end of the season. I left uh, Toronto when Pat Quinn was uh, still there. So I never really experienced it, but I think it's just uh, that Bergman's trying to get uh, the team going. And, you know, unfortunately, like I said, it's easier to sometimes fire the coach and blame the coach than it is to trade players with their contracts now with the, you know, with the way things are. But um, I mean, I, when, when even when George got fired and uh, him and I looked, you know, we looked at the game a little bit differently and saw things a little bit differently uh, when I played there and he coached there, but you still feel bad. I mean, in the end, it's us that are going on the ice and playing the game and we, it's up to us to, to find ways to win hockey games and play the way we're capable of playing. For a guy, you, you mentioned Burnett and you mentioned the struggles that you guys kind of had, uh, yeah. like you said, not seeing eye to eye. Uh, you know, for you as a player, when you're going to battle and, and you're not necessarily feeling, you know, the, the, the love from the coach, how can that affect you on the ice? Is that is that something that plays in your mind or is it just something you just kind of put to the side and, and go ahead forth with? Well, you, you try to put it aside for sure, but it definitely plays with your mind a little bit. When you feel that the coach doesn't have confidence in you as a, as a player or as a leader, it, it's definitely tough on you, especially when you take pride in your game and take pride in being a leader and, and a, a player that cares about your teammates. And uh, so it definitely, it definitely plays into it. And you try to do the best you can to put it aside and just go out and play your game. And when you, you're putting the ice, go play. And when you're asked to do something, do what you can. And, uh, but I mean, like I said, George and I, we had difference of opinion on how a captain should uh, be. And that's just his opinion and my opinion. I mean, I have no ill feelings towards George Burnett. He's uh, gone on to have a great junior career coaching and general manager, but yeah, it definitely uh, plays in the, to the confidence side of it. And, uh, and sometimes we don't have the, the belief, uh, in, in your coach, it, it, it trickles down. But I mean, I had great teammates in Edmonton. It was, it was a bit of a struggle that time for us. We were, uh, not making the playoffs and uh, every one of them, we were a young team and uh, that was frustrating. I mean, after the great years that the Oilers had and having the opportunity to play with Wayne Gretzky and Messi and those guys in the Canada cup in 91, it would have been a lot of fun to be around when they were playing. I'll tell you that they're just uh, <laughs> winning championships and just a lot of fun. So it's a lot more fun when you're winning. It's a lot more tough when you're losing hockey. Games. So I'm sure they, the Oilers now are having a lot, a lot of fun now and hopefully they can keep it going because they've had some tough years in the past also. So it's well, definitely, definitely part of it. Well, and Shane, you, you know, I mean, for a guy that you, you say, like you were a leader and, and you were a guy that went out and literally fought for your teammates, 131 fights career, all time in your career, uh, according to any, or to hockeyfights.com. And, uh, you know, it, it, like, is there a, is there a, a player or a moment that sticks out in your career and in your mind that where you just kind of, you know, you knew you had to go out there and do something for the team to, to make it happen? Or, or is there a rival that maybe you, you like to, uh, to square off with and fight? I know you've, uh, you had a, a lot of matchups against Randy Moeller. You, you fought Bob Sweeney three times, Joey Koser. Like, <laughs> is there anybody that sticks out in your mind? Um. Yeah, well, I've, I've had so many fights, I can't even remember all of them. I saw so many on YouTube. And, oh, my God, I, I don't remember fighting that guy, but I, I fought a lot of guys. I mean, one of the ones that I remember the most, oddly enough, is in training camp when I was I was uh, in Montreal's training camp. I fought John Cordic, who became my roommate. Uh, him and Mike Lauer became my roommate my rookie year, but they had just won the Stanley Cup. I was actually up to the Stanley Cup. I was supposed to play that year, but I tore my knee and my ankle up my last game of junior hockey. So, um I went and watched, but unfortunately I didn't get to play, so I didn't get a Stanley Cup ring. But I knew I had to do something special, so I wanted to show them that I was willing to stick up for my teammates and fight if I had to. So I decided to fight John Cordick. And, you know, luckily enough, I did pretty good. I think it was because I was so <laughs> terrified of my – I did pretty good. And he wanted to fight me again, but I, I, I owe a lot to Chris Nyland. Chris Nyland came over and said, no, you're not fighting him again, Johnny. That's our first rounder, so we're going to leave him alone. <laughs> That's a training camp. But, I mean, that, that, was, that was pretty crazy. But I have to say um, – 
Another one I remember is when we played, we played Calgary a lot. We had a real battle with Calgary all the time. I fought, I fought Ronnie Stern and uh, we had a good fight. Uh, he actually caught me off guard, hit me with a pretty good first one, but uh, I rebounded pretty good and did pretty, pretty well. And I have a picture of me on top of him on the ice with my hands around his neck. I've actually posted on Instagram <laughs> at Shane Corson 27. So that's a good picture that I have here in my house. But, and then another one was Owen Nolan. Um, I fought Owen Nolan. We were both captains at the time. I was uh, wearing the C in Montreal at the time. And Owen was the captain in uh, San Jose. And we, we scored off at center ice. And it was a good battle. Two captains fight with center ice in the, in Montreal, the bell center. So, and then I, and I, I ended up becoming really good. I talked to Owen Nolan uh, once a month still play with him here in Toronto. And he's just a great guy and good Irish kid. And he, he was the same, uh, same type of guy played hard for his team and, and stuck up for his teammates and just a, just a, just a quality guy. So there are some that I remember. I fought Bobby Probert, who was my line mate for a year and a half in junior <laughs> hockey until we, we traded him to Sault Ste. Marie. We played him 12 times. I go, why did we do that? Traded Bob <laughs> Probert this soon. I had to play him 12 times, but luckily enough, luckily enough, he was a buddy of mine because I played on his line for a year and a half. So he took it easy on me, but I was pretty scared when I went into the pileup and I seen him in there <laughs> picking on one of our defense, but I thought I, I better do something, but he took it easy on me. But there's so many of them. I mean, there's so many tough oh, yeah. guys in the, in the seventies and eighties and, and even into the early 90s, there was a lot of tough late 90s. And then even in the early 2000s, when I played here in Toronto, there was a lot of battles, a lot of wars. But, I mean, I have a lot of respect for the guys. I, I wasn't a heavyweight in any means. I would fight anybody if I had to for my teammates or for myself. But there were so many guys that were tough and uh, from, the, from the early 70s uh, right through to the, uh, the, uh, ni- the, the mid-90s, late, late, actually mid-2000s. I have a lot of respect for those guys. I mean, I think that's the toughest job that uh, – in the league myself personally that's what i believe and and unfortunately we've lost a lot of those guys i mean i was close to john cordick and and todd you and i mean uh wade belock uh three solid guys they're teddy bears off the ice and uh they had the toughest job in, in the world to go out there and have to look across the ice and think i gotta fight like probably one of those guys where there's always like five or six guys in each team that could, could fight and they knew every night they're gonna have to do that and that's that's i have a lot of respect for those guys and we owe a lot to those guys as players they they were the guys that would stick up for us and take care of us when we we're on the ice. So we could just go out and play our game. Look at you, you mentioned Shane, that um, fighting is now kind of leaving the game a little bit since you played yeah. and just hearing you kind of talk about it just now and how tough a job that is. How do you think the taking the self policing aspect out of hockey has affected kind of the product on the ice, be it whether that's being chippier or you got guys that are running around a little bit more. Do you think that's had a, an actual effect taking that aspect up? I mean, I'm old school. Uh, I mean, I, I, I understand why I've taken the fighting out. I mean, I had a son that, that played junior hockey and fought a bit. And every time he fought, I was terrified for, for him to get hurt or injured or hurt his head. And I know you have a life after hockey and you have to, uh, you know, enjoy your life the best you can. And it, it's proven that it's, it affects guys, obviously. Uh, I've not mentioned some of them already, but uh, I'm old school. And I, I think, I think it has affected it. I mean, you, you're Connor McDavid or you're like Sidney Crosby or something like that. There are guys that sometimes, sometimes try to take advantage of them a little bit. And, uh, it's unfortunate and sometimes the policing is is good to have around for those guys. And, and I, I hate to say it, but there's been a lot more checking from behind. I think the respect side of it with the stick works a little bit different than it was when we played. I mean, you knew that if you're going to run somebody from behind, you're going to pay the price the next shift probably, or use your stick and you're going to pay the price the next shift. So I don't think there was as much as that, uh, the, 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 the checking from behind the stick work, uh, anyways, up around the face. I'm not saying there wasn't a lot of slashing and stick work in, in my day. There was a lot of hook, and we used to ski behind guys on the way down. The <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ski you guys from had check, right? so, Yeah, we, had, we would ski behind them. Fort when they were trying to four check. We'd be skiing behind them, trying to make them from, from going in. And and that was another play. Like the, the hitting, you can't you can't get in somebody's way or you can't interfere with them a little bit so that the forwards can't get in and just cream your defenseman. So there's a lot of things that have changed the game, and I understand in a way why they have, but I definitely think it's affected, uh, you know, the top end players where they get maybe taken advantage at times and, uh, and players can't do anything about it, but I, I get, I get it. And it's, it's a difficult, uh, it's a fine line, I think right now. And with the head injuries and all this, the, the, the evidence that we have where guys have got hurt and me being a guy that's fought. I mean, I know that my memory's not the way it used to be. And, and I have my moments too. And I've, I've suffered with anxiety and panic attacks and health problems. So I get what they're trying to do, but uh, I'm old school and I, I miss that side of it. And I think that it, there is a, uh, a place for a little bit of policing uh, uh, with the players, but um, you know, the league make the decision and they shall pay and make the decisions and the alumni and all that. So they, they know what's best and they, they, they know what they're doing. They're trying to move the game forward in a different direction. And I understand that speed and skill. And there's a lot of that out there and it's, 
impressive to watch as an ex-player. Going back through your career a little bit as an oiler, I know we touched on it a bit, but I want to go back to kind of when it started and you were dealt from the Habs to the Oilers in 1992. What was sort of your first impression of Edmonton? Like when you heard the news that, that you were being moved, like what was sort of the first thing that popped into your mind? Well, I I definitely was, um, anytime you get traded, you're a little bit disappointed originally right away. But, um, when I got to Edmonton, I loved it. I loved the city of Edmonton. Uh, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't really want to leave. When I left as a restricted free agent, Keenan made me an offer. And I had said the slots I would play with at that point, we were paid in Canadian dollars in Canada and us dollars in the States. So I said, just match the Canadian dollars. And I really would have stayed in Edmonton. I loved it. I love the city. I love the people. It's a great sports town. Like it's just a great sports town. They love their Eskimos. They love their Oilers and, and they like my, they like my type of player. I mean, they love a player that goes out there and plays hard and puts, uh, put his heart on his sleeve and, and, and fights and battles for his teammates and for himself and for the, for the Jersey and for the city. And, and, and I love playing there and enjoyed it and uh, had a lot of fun. And I mean, it was a bit of a difficult time for us. We didn't make the playoffs for a young team and that's, that's always tough. Uh, but to become to a team that's had that much history too, and such a short time with, you know, Messi and Gretzky and Curry and Glennie Anderson, who I played with Glennie in, in St. Louis and then played with Messi and, and Gretzky. And I played with Gretzky on the line, the Canada Cup in 91, and then again in St. Louis. So I got to know those guys uh, quite well. But, I mean, they had impressive uh, seasons and were probably, if not one of the greatest team, the greatest team ever, one of the greatest teams. I think the, the Canadians in the 70s and the Oilers were two of the best teams ever play. And there was a couple of great Boston teams too, obviously. But, um I just enjoyed the city. It was my type of city. My son Dylan was born in Edmonton, Alberta. He's a cowboy. He drives a pickup truck and loves country music. <laughs> and and I, my favorite music is country music now too. And um, it was tough to leave. I'm not going to lie to you. When I signed in St. Louis, it wasn't an easy decision. Uh, but I I thought it was the best uh, option. And slots was always difficult to deal with in, with contracts, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I love the city and, and uh, never really wanted to leave at that time. Well, so Shane, you you found yourself playing in in a unique situation. You've played in three different Canadian cities, um, yeah. you know, and and for that, as an Edmonton fan, what is it like being in in the different cities? Like the, the, everybody talks about how it's tough to play in a Canadian city. Where where did you find was the toughest to play? Where was the easiest to play? And where was the most fun to play? Well, I gotta say, playing in Canada was the best. I mean, I don't care what anybody says, playing in any Canadian hockey city, they love their hockey and it's the, the number one sport. I mean, I played in St. Louis for that year and a bit and then I got traded back to Montreal. I was in Dallas. I went at the end of my career, they asked me to come down and just play 15 games in the playoffs. And I mean, there, there are two great cities too, don't get me wrong, but there, there, there's other sports there. They got college sports. They love their basketball and their football and baseball on, on top of hockey, whereas Canada, they just love their hockey so much. I mean, lacrosse is a good sport and basketball and with the Raptors always growing a lot and soccer has too with the, the soccer, but hockey's let's face the number one sport and Canadian uh, hockey fans are so, so uh, passionate about their, their game and they, they love their hockey and yeah, they put pressure on you, but that's where you want to be. You want to be in a hockey city where they put pressure on you because you put pressure on yourself as a player anyway. So you don't really feel the pressure from outside. You just feel the passion and they give you a lift. And that's the way I looked at it. They lifted us up in games that we needed it. The fans were so passionate about it. And, I mean, it was tough playing in Montreal and Toronto because the media was so, uh, there was so much media in our, like we'd have 30, 40 uh, news outlets in our room uh, interviewing us where in Edmonton, it was obviously a smaller uh, market and there was less media, uh, but there was obviously pressure because the, the, the Oilers of the old were so, they won so many cups and they were always, always in the, it seemed they were always in the final or, or fight for the Stanley Cup. So there was pressure on that sense. But I mean, Edmonton and, and Montreal and Toronto, they all, uh, Montreal too won so many cups, right? It was a little bit different in Toronto. If you got to the playoffs and did well in the playoffs, they were pumped. I mean, the 2000, 2003, the city was crazy because we made it to the semifinals a couple of times. So it's a little bit different pressure in each city. Uh, Montreal and Edmonton were expected. To, they wanted you to win, not just get to the playoffs. But Edmonton, they just, they appreciated if you went out and worked hard every night. They knew we were young. They understood that we were young and we were rebuilding. And, uh, you know, shortly after, I, a couple of years after I'd left, they, they had a couple of good runs with Smitty coming in there and Dougie Wade and, uh, a few Billy Garen and guys like that. Um, so it was pretty exciting to watch too. Don't, don't kid, kid yourself. I was watching those runs too and excited for the team and the organization, the city, because they deserve it. But there was a, different pluses and minuses from each, uh, each city, but uh, the, the pluses over outweighed the minuses on all three cities. So I'd have to say that, uh, you know, I, I owe a lot to the Montreal Canadiens because they drafted me and gave me the, the opportunity to realize my dream and play in the NHL. And then, you know, obviously growing up in Ontario, 40 minutes from Toronto, I was a huge Leafs fan. 
but I'm a big, a big Oilers fan and a big city of Edmonton fan because I just love the people are so down to earth and, and uh, they're hardworking people and they just, they appreciated hardworking players. And um, uh, they were really good to me and fair to me as, as fans. And, and, and the organization was really good to me. And, and I also got close to, like I said, Gretz and got to know Messier and, and, and Kevin Lowe and Grant Fuhrer, another guy, and, and Glennie Anderson. I just have a lot of respect for those guys as hockey players and as people. So I loved, uh, loved the city of Edmonton too. Yeah, uh, I know you mentioned, of- sorry, sorry, Mike Bagnock, I'm going to hop go, in here. Ahead, yeah, I know you mentioned that, uh, you know, some lean years sort of in Edmonton, and this is kind of a yeah. broad question, but if I had to ask you for your favorite memory as an oiler, and maybe it's not even something on the ice, maybe it's something behind the scenes like that, but what would you say your yeah. favorite moment as an oiler was? Oh, that's easy. I mean, spending time with, uh, with our board, Joey Moss. I mean, I got really close with Joey, uh, had him over at my house for many sleepovers, uh, I know that other players before me used to do it and many players did it after me, but uh, to have him over for sleepovers and you know, either have our burger night or a pizza night, just getting to know him. Uh, I mean, he made every day special because you could have, be having the worst days and thank God we haven't had him around for those three years because there was a lot of tough days because we were losing. We weren't making the playoffs, but you realized how lucky we were to have something like that around and not never give up. And he was always happy and smiling no matter what challenges he had. And he taught me that and he taught me to, you know, the love and, to be happy and to, and to let people love you. And that's uh, something that I'll never forget that relationship that I have with Joey. And, and, and I mean, being voted by the fans as the favorite player uh, a couple of times while I was in Edmonton was special to me too, because for me, that's the most important thing. Something I got taught uh, at an early uh, in my, my, my hockey career, actually, because I was a fan and a kid growing up and asking for hockey sticks and uh, to, to, to have the fans behind you uh, meant a lot to me because uh, they're the reason why we got to play a game. We love to play and get paid to do it and not have to work uh, on the side as a lot of hockey players did before me had to do. And a lot of the amateur athletes have to do to, to want to make it to the Olympics. So uh, the time I spent with Joy Moss and then another special time was when I went to the, the closing of the Rexall center. Uh, it was a lot of fun to be around all the ex-oilers, all those legendary hall of fame guys. And then the guys that I play with and for them to invite all the players that ever wore that Jersey was so special and uh, a lot of fun and to, to be there for the closing of the Rexall center and watch uh, the jerseys and the captain's banner. I unfortunately was a captain for a short period of time there, but <laughs> I appreciate it and had a lot of fun and enjoyed that night too. As a fan, I was able, I was very lucky. I was able to be at that last game at Rexall and it was super cool to see yeah. all of you guys out at center ice. And, you know, Joey yeah. was there. You walked into my last question, Shane. I mean, yep. October, we obviously lost Joey Moss. But at the end of anything for Joey that's going up on Sportsnet every now and then, I saw you in there. And I was hoping you could just leave us off with maybe, you know, like you said, you spent three three years in Edmonton, got to spend a lot of time with him. Is there just – it just seems like everybody loved this guy so yeah. much. Is there just something about Joey you can leave us with just kind of as, as a memory that's very special to you or just something we don't know about why everyone loved him as much as they did? It's just the love that he gave out and this, his smile. Like I said, uh, I mean, I get emotional. When I talk about him because it was like he was one of my best friends in Edmonton. And uh, I could be having the worst day of my, my uh, you know, my season or my life. And uh, I would walk in that dress room and have a big smile on his face. He was always smiling. He was always in a good mood. And he just looked at me and go, feel good. Why not? That was his saying, feel good. Why not? And just give me a big hug. And uh, he just had a warm heart and cared about everybody. Uh, and could just make you feel special. And that's something that I'll never forget. And he made me, certainly made me feel special and taught me a lot, taught me to feel lucky and appreciate what I had and, uh, and to stay focused and realize that you can re- reach anything you want to reach in life if you work at it and stay positive. And that's something that he was. He was one of the most positive people I've ever been around in my life, no matter what he had to deal with. And uh, it's something that I'll never forget. And that smile of his and um it's just like there's so many memories i mean it, we had so much fun together and he he had, he was he was one of the funniest human beings i've ever been around and and like i said he could just bring a smile to your face instantly and um i cherish every moment that i spent with him and i'll never forget him that's, i know a lot of former awesome. Oilers they would talk about when they came back to town was he one of those were you one of those guys that would always go back <laughs> to see joey anytime you came back to town Oh man, I mean, he'd be down the room waiting for us in the, the visiting room dressing room. He'd be waiting. But I mean, Sparky Lyle was really good to Joy too. And I and I don't know if you guys know Sparky. But Sparky was one of our trainers at the time too. And Sparky's a good friend of mine. I still talk to Sparky every once in a while. And but he'd always get Joy going because 
we'd we'd be down in the visiting room and uh, he'd go to he'd go to Joey, who's your favorite number nine? Because I wore nine after I wore twenty one for a short period. I moved to number nine and he's put Joy in the spot because Glennie Anderson was number nine too. Or who who was your favorite <laughs> player? Number nine or eleven or ninety nine? And Joy's I'm standing there, Joy, what is he gonna say, right? Like uh, but it was always fun and Sparky would play games with him. But Joy wasn't uh wasn't as stupid. He he knew he'd go number nine, Shane Cor- Cors Corson was his favorite because because I was standing there with <laughs> Andy was there would be Glenn Anderson, right? So yeah, yeah, pretty funny or uh but we just had so much fun and yeah, I definitely spent some time with him every time I came into Edmonton to play and and like I said, it was like he was one of my best friends and it's uh, I miss him dearly and and I miss I miss Wayne Gretzky's fantasy camp down in, in Vegas a lot too because We'd be down there for a week, and let me tell you, boys, it was a lot of fun. Like, we can do it a lot. Of we'll do another podcast where they're all stories and fun stories and yeah. things that you don't hear about. Uh, the, the more of the off ice stuff, but we had a lot of fun down there for the week. I appreciated Gretz having me down there, and it was a time a time where I could spend a lot of time with Joy too, and get and get uh, caught up in him and Sparky. So I miss those days because there was. I think we've been done now two, three years. We haven't been doing it. It was one of the funnest times I've ever had in my life, and for a great cause for Gretz's foundation. So uh, they were fun times. Well, Shane, I, I don't know if there's a better name for a podcast than Feel Good, Why Not? Yeah. That's, no that's a beautiful. That's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you for the time, man. And yeah. thank you for everything you've done. You know, as a guy that runs hockeyfights.com, we that your your highlights will live there forever. Hopefully it's uh it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you, my friend. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys, and uh thanks for the follows and uh if anybody else wants to follow me at, at Shane Corson twenty seven. But I appreciate getting on these podcasts too and letting people know me as a human being and uh, talking hockey and I'm open to talk about anything. And if you ever want to talk about anything else, like I said, the stories off the ice or <laughs> mental health, which I'm, which I'm big about I do mental health and helping people uh, be more than happy to go on, come on with you guys. I really appreciate the time and your, your platform guys. Yeah, well, Shane, I was going to say, uh, before we let you go here, we always have people whenever we talk to ex-Oilers, they always want to know what they're up to now. So uh, talking about Shane Corson, the person a little sort of what's your day to day, like what kind of, what kind of projects are you involved in and stuff like that? Well, right now I'm locked up, boys. I'm in quarantine. <laughs> I, had to, I had to go down to Boston to see my daughter. My daughter plays at Boston College Hockey down there. So uh, I had to go down for a week down there. So I've been locked up for 14 days, and today's the first day I can get outside. So I've been doing a lot of the uh, Peloton, so I'm actually in shape again. Maybe nice. I can come back. <laughs> nice. <laughs> watching, a, watching a lot of Netflix. Uh, what do you, I think it's called the uh, Pinky Blinders. I watched a bit of that. Okay. I just uh, started. <laughs> <laughs> and successions I'm watching too. Uh, but, but I try to use, I, I just got into social media, to be honest with you, really in the last uh, eight months. Uh, I know it plays a big part and just trying to use my platform to help with mental health and, and stuff like that. I mean, I suffered with panic attacks and anxiety and depression as a lot of people do that. I've realized I just try to use platforms like this on my platform to help, help people and try to help with charity events. And, and uh, like I said, hopefully this opens up and I can do some stuff with the alumni and do some hockey games, charity events and alumni games because they're a lot of fun and it's a good place to catch up, right? Absolutely. Yep. You mentioned your Twitter, Shane Corson 27 and of course your website, ShaneCorson27.com as well. Uh, keep doing good stuff like this, Shane. We really appreciate your time and we'll take you up on that offer to have you back on the pod again soon. Yeah, come back on, boys, and we'll tell, we'll tell some fun stories, some <laughs> funny stories. It's more serious. We'll do some fun stuff. But, yeah, don't forget my Instagram. I'm more active on my Instagram. Yeah, yeah. That's Shane Corson 27 but I use it more for, like, the, just having trying to help fun. people. I think, I think that's yeah. – and having fun, exactly. And, I, I mean, it's just – it's important and that we do this. And I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, have me on and talk to the old guys because – we don't want to be forgotten yet, boys. <laughs> Never will. Chance. Never Perfect. will. Shane. Once another, always another, friend. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks for the time, Appreciate Shane. It. Thanks, yeah. guys. There you go. That is former Oilers captain, Shane Corson, NHL veteran. That was really good. I mean, that's a guy who he's doing this stuff for like the right reason, you know, like he's really passionate about the mental health. He's done a ton of cancer research help as well, all that stuff. And he shared some, he shared some good stories and I like that good podcast material when he can tease us for his next visit. Well, you know what? I, I, I think the thing that I like the most is without us even asking, some of these guys are already volunteering yeah. their next spot on the podcast. So I, I just think it's really cool to hear kind of the stories. And he promised us promised us some off ice stuff that should be entertaining next time we have him on too. So really, really cool to be able to talk to these guys and see what they're up to. Funny enough was uh, Shane Corson was also doing a little bit of scouting on us the other day, boys, because post game, against the Canucks last night, or no, maybe it was it last night? Two a couple days ago. Two nights ago, yeah. Shane Corson popped into the uh, the beat cast 
temporarily. He didn't say anything at all, but I saw him in there for a little bit. I gave him a shout out, but he didn't respond. So he was doing a little bit of homework on us before jumping on with the podcast. And I'm pretty excited that we get to have these guests on. So, um, great guy, great yeah. stories. Love the, yeah. I just, I also love hearing these guys talk about how much they loved Edmonton. I yeah. don't know yeah. how many people would have known that Shane Corson didn't want to leave when he did. That was news to me. Yeah, I think for a lot of people that listen to these podcasts, especially, you know, like our younger listeners, you know, as, as you know, silly as that is to say, um, there is people that probably didn't even realize that Shane Corson was an oiler for, for as long as he was and had so much of a, you know, so much of an impact on him being in this city. It's, but it's, it's so awesome. You know, Oilers Nation is, you know, it, we were, I, I like to think we're kind of uh, ambassadors for a great city and, and uh, I don't know, am I upsetting Tyler here? I can't tell. No, 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 no. My mic's muted. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's fun to watch and listen to these guys talk about it and, and, and just be real dudes and real people um, with us. It's, it's a blast. I also just like, I can't get enough of it, boys, hearing these guys talk about Joey. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're already, you know, we're already four months it's been four months since uh, the passing of Joey Moss, but to hear these guys talk about him, whether it was George a couple of weeks ago or Shane Corson just now, it's, it just, it, it feels good to know how much Joey Moss meant to them even all these years later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good to And like, you don't need, like, I, I didn't even ask him about Joey Moss to start. I just said your best memories in Edmonton and he was instantly Joey Moss. Like, that's awesome. It was awesome. It just like, like, like I said, it was just my last question and you walked it, walked him right into it, mm. even inadvertently. And it's just cool to know that everything we thought about Joey Moss as fans of the team from an outside perspective, it was what was actually happening to a factor of 10 behind the scenes. Yeah. I'm a little, you know I mean? I'm a little sad that it took the loss of Joey for us to like really think to ask this question every time, but I mean, it is what it is. Um, you know, but it is, yeah, it is, it's just amazing because every guy that we've talked to that's been in that locker room has had a story. Did for Steve even have one? I feel like for Steve had one. Like it, you know, it's like for guys that were here for a minute, they have a Joey Moss story and a Joey Moss memory. And he's a part of this organization that will, will live on forever with stories. So yeah, we've got to keep them telling it. Absolutely. What a beauty. Yeah. What a beauty. Shane Corson. Coming in with the heat. Again, go follow him on social media because he's putting out some good stuff. And do us a favor. Make sure to let him know how much you enjoyed the interview after you hear it. Yes. Say, hey, heard you on Oilers Nation Radio. Great interview. I think you would probably dig that as well. Tyler? Yep. I hope you've got your script ready, my friend. It is time. <laughs> the Manscaped Hot and Cold Performers. Manscaped Hot and Cold Performers. You know who's fired up for the NHL season to be back or for the hockey season to be back? Our friends at Manscaped. And uh, we're fired up as well. 20% off at manscaped.com with the code ON Radio and Bag Milk. We talked about this on Real Life. You have gotten your package in the mail. Dan, did you get your uh, Manscaped I, package yet? I sure did. The and I don't know about did. you, but I gave myself, I said this yesterday on Real Life, and I'm going to say it again here. I gave myself a full detailing with the lawnmower. And I got to say, this thing is a hell of a product. It treated my beans with love and respect. Mm -hmm. There was no clipping or cutting or snagging. Nope. All the things you worry about, those are problems of the past, my friends. And I can tell you, there's no more kitten in the tall grass here at the Castle Bag Milk. We are cleaned up, looking fresh, feeling good. Thanks. And if oh, you're wondering yeah. if you missed last week and you're wondering what the deal is with this stuff, go to manscaped.com. The promo code ON radio gets you 20% off and free shipping with everything. But the thing I like the most is the performance package regular 295. They already got it marked down to 160. It includes the lawnmower 3.0 with their skin safe electric trimmer, crop preserver, crop reviver, magic mat, weed whacker on top of that. You also get the shed and their manscaped boxers, which I'm rocking right now and they are incredibly comfortable. With our promo code ON Radio, that goes from 159 to about 127. Dirt cheap, great self care product. Can't put a price on uh, on being able to safely clean up your downstairs, right? That's that's what I'm saying. Is this is uh you know this is a call to men to take care of yourself in yes. all manners and and all ways. You know, check your prostate health and all that good stuff. And it's, shave it's your balls. Shave and your shave balls. your balls. Thanks to Manscaped Eek. for hooking us up.
we care about the presentation of your package and our friends at Manscaped are here to help. And that promo code again, Tyler? O-N radio. Shave your balls, boys. Shave Mm -hmm. your balls. All right. As we do every week, gentlemen, we start with our veggies on the Manscaped Hot and Cold Performer. So we are looking at the cold performer of the week from the last seven days. Mr. Nation Dan, you were beside me on the Zoom screen. Your Manscaped Cold Performer of the Week. Well, my Manscaped Cold Performer of the Week is the guy who spurned on the comeback, in my opinion, and then was found himself last night in the box when Jesse oh. Pulavi <laughs> scored a goal. It's I Antoine Roussel. <laughs> Antoine Roussel decided to touch Jesse Pugliarvi, which pissed off everybody and Nuggy Hopkins. And it, like I said, it spurned on this team. This team seemed to be fired up afterwards. Jesse went out and scored a goal while Roussel sat in the box watching him. So, Antoine Roussel, while you're a hot performer for the Edmonton Oilers, maybe the MVP of the week for the Edmonton Oilers, you're my Manscaped.com Cold Performer of the Week. <laughs> I just, I'd love to know what he was thinking. It doesn't, it's first like, game against Vancouver. Like they were having a little board battle. He yeah. pulled the RV, but then he just dropped the mitts and started throwing hands. Like, I don't understand at all what he was thinking. The Jesse dropping the gloves Lynch part. As used as yeah. all of us. The dropping the gloves part makes absolutely no sense. It's like, I understand if you, if you think you've engaged with a guy that's going to punch back. Absolutely. But like, Worst case, Ontario, you just shove Jesse a couple times with your gloves on, and it's probably more effective anyway. But what the hell was the referee doing only giving that two minutes? It's just so it's, confusing. It's interesting because uh, resident nation referee surveyor Brett jumped in mm-hmm. on that conversation. He was just talking about how it's weird that there is no call. There's no such thing as a double minor for roughing. Yeah, basically. that is well, weird. Like, they usually you just... do two and ten or something like that, yeah. but... They weird. usually just give like double double roughing, like they'll give like two to a guy if he's if he does the extra, right? But yeah, it's that was confusing. It was bizarre. Antoine Roussel, you're cold. It's weird because you can like you can inadvertently stick somebody on a follow through as an example, or when you're skating and you can get a double minor for high sticking in that case. But when you drop the mitts and throw hands and bust a guy's nose open, there's nothing. All right, weird. Uh, moving on, Tyler, your manscaped cold performer of the week. The Edmonton Oilers have won 11 of their last 13 games. Everyone's Mm -hmm. feeling good. They've beaten every team in the division on this stretch. And yet still, somehow, there are people on Twitter bitching about this hockey club. And my cold performer will be to the people who are not enjoying this win streak. Think back through the decade of darkness. Think of how many times in a February or a March or hell, a November where you had to watch this team go out and play a game that meant nothing. They were out of it. They were dead in the water. They weren't coming back. Nothing. It meant nothing. You're Mm. finally watching meaningful hockey team, hockey games, and your team is winning those meaningful hockey games. to the people bitching on Twitter, you are my cold performer of the week. What the hell is going on? You know Look what? I couldn't Calgary and Montreal right now. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more, Tyler. And it's like, Oilers fans, we need to get to a spot where you can just have a little bit of fun. Because you know what it was a couple of weeks ago? Let's back it up for a second. Oilers beat Ottawa. And people are like, whoa, they're only beating Ottawa Senators. This doesn't <laughs> counter. They're only beating your Senators. And then they, you know. And then they beat the Flames, and now they beat the Canucks. It's like, wow, the, the Flames suck, and blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, it's it's disappointing and it's frustrating. Yeah. But as as uh, Shane Corson said, feel happy. Why not? Was that the same? I can't even remember now. But from Joey Moss. Uh, feel, good, feel, feel good, why not? Feel good, why not? Of episode 126, feel good, why not, Shane Corson. Um, just to wrap things up, my oodle uh, – Shout out to Oodle. I might get some later. Uh, but my manscaped cold performer of the week is he's down the highway. Eric Francis. Oh, not no. knowing what depth is. And not knowing what depth scoring is. I know this happened last weekend in the Battle of Alberta, but we haven't recorded since. Eric Francis saying the Oilers have zero depth to speak of. And then the fourth line goes out and beats the Flames that night. It was perfect. It was perfect. Also called a, I also believe he called Ottawa Senators a bingo spot on the board. Yeah, despite free space game. on the bingo card. Free space on the bingo card. There you go. And <laughs> the Flames got absolutely lit up by the Sens last night. Eric Francis, cold form of the week. That's a joke. That's an absolute joke is what it is. Flipping the ledger to the hot performers of the week. 
I'm going to go ahead and get this started just because I'm selfish. My Manscaped Hot Performer of the Week is Mike Smith. How can it not be? The guy has been red hot between the pipes. He had that one game that was iffy, but since then he's been sticking it up the backside of all his critics, to quote Brownlee. Mike Smith, Manscaped Hot Performer of the Week. He's a hot guy! Mm. Dan, your Manscaped Hot Performer of the Week. Yeah, I was going to go Smithers too. Uh, I'll pivot to uh, to a guy that every time he hits the ice, I just I I'm blown away by his composure, and it's young old Evan Bouchard. That guy gives me so much hope for this future with this team. Uh, I said it last night. We haven't had a shot like his on the team since Pronger or Sheldon Surrey, depending on how you uh, look back at the Sheldon Surrey time. He, but he's his composure, his his ability to just shoot the puck everywhere, which seems to be an issue at some times for this team. Uh, but Evan Bouchard, my hot performer of the week and, and has me so excited for the season. Mr. Uramchuk, wrap us up with your manscaped hot performer of the week. Listen, there are so many Oilers you could give this to, but I'm going to give mine to a former Oiler last <laughs> night. Sammy G, Sam Gagne, friend of the nation, yes. friend of the real life podcast, friend of Yegberger as well. A hat trick for the NHL veteran. It feel, I just love watching Sam Gagne score goals in the NHL still. And uh, it even led me to start wondering on Twitter, what would it take for the Oilers to bring him back for a magical playoff run? Sam Gagne, congrats on your hat trick. You get my hot performer of the week. The big guy is smoking hot. And if I recall, that's the last time he got a hat trick was eight point night. Eight points, yeah. It was. They like mentioned it in the broadcast. So last there's night. almost a decade between hat tricks for Sam Gagne. Congratulations, my friend. Well deserved. The people of Detroit are lucky to have you. Lucky to have you. Uh, that will be all for Oilers Nation episode Oilers Nation Radio episode 126. I want to thank our friends at Sherwood for the Giants, skip the dish.ca, tourism Jasper and Manscaped for making it all possible. And a very special thank you to Shane Corson for giving us a little bit of his time today to talk Oilers, great Joey Moss stories, and just being a genuinely nice guy. So thank you to Shane Corson. Thank you to all, all of you for listening. My last request before Tyler pushes the end button is that you leave us a review. Wherever you get your podcast from, I've looked this morning. There's nothing new on Oilers Nation Radio, and I would love to know how we're doing. Whether you like what we're doing or whether you hate it, please leave us your review. I will read them. Or maybe just give a shout-out to some people you know. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I'll read we'll it. Read it. Let us know of what you thought of our great conversation before the Shane Corson interview as well. Or you could do what some real life listeners are doing and just give your takes that you want read on the podcast. Yeah, that's what I'll read. Shit. Whatever you want. Just leave us a review. We will read it. from myself, from Dan and Tyler. This is Oilers nation radio episode 126. That's a wrap. Have a great weekend, everybody. Shout out Damien. Best wishes. Thanks for listening to Oilers nation radio, a member of the nation network of podcasts. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media to stay up to date and never miss a podcast.